Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it's it's a real pleasure and honor to to be to be with you, and thanks to the Rhodes Trust very much for inviting me along. And John's just given you a fantastic uh, presentation. I, I'm actually in 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 addressing you. I'm, I'm in fact breaking one of the cardinal rules of politics, which is that as a politician you should never give a speech on a subject in front of an audience who knows what they're talking about on that subject. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I did actually recently have to give a speech on cryptocurrency. <clears throat> and <laughs> I um, tried to read up about it, couldn't understand anything. I finally phoned my son who's in the technology business and he tried to explain it to me, I didn't understand it. So he sent me something called the Idiot's Guide to Cryptocurrency. After reading it, I realized I'd attained a new level of stupidity because I didn't <laughs> understand that either. I phoned him on the morning of the speech and said, so what on earth do I tell this audience? He said, tell them you're sick. <laughs> <laughs> so with that in mind, I'm actually gonna focus on the, the, the political aspect of this and with a suggestion as to future action that we might take. Um, and obviously the background is, is the, the COVID pandemic and what we've, what we've learned from it. But COVID-19 left around 15 million people dead globally, millions with the long COVID condition, an estimated $12 trillion economic impact, which even if it's hard to be precise about it, okay, we measure it in trillions, not billions, a massive effect on lost years of education, especially for the poorest communities, and a stack of untreated or uncared for other illnesses whose consequences are now coming home to roost. In addition, there was huge inequity in the treatment of the disease, in the manufacture and distribution of vaccines, and in the ability of healthcare systems to cope. So the world survived COVID, but at a vast cost. And predictions of future pandemics range from the possible to the probable, but no one assesses the risk as negligible. I've just been talking to one of the experts who told me it was in fact 27.5%. So there you go. Not 27 or 28, by the way, 27.5. Um, but the point is, it's not negligible. Because of the possibility that any such future pandemic could involve a virus more deadly than COVID-19, it is recognized that we should ensure the capability globally to act much faster and more effectively than for COVID, the so-called 100 days and so on. Okay, all of this is clear, and actually it's clear to most political leaders. Therefore, the case for action in the way that John has just laid out is extraordinarily strong. But, and in politics there's always a but, these leaders, particularly if they're operating in democratic systems, also have a cost of living crisis to deal with, a war in Europe, energy prices, climate change, supply chain challenges, and other very proximate issues upon which their people demand action, and usually with money attached. A year ago, frankly, talking to global leaders about pandemic preparedness was a relevant conversation which stimulated a fair amount of interest. Very frankly today, not so much, and that's a big problem. Moreover, the main forum which should coordinate global health action, the G20, has a fundamental political schism at its center. The G7 is the Western world, not the world, and the UN is, well, the UN, <laughs> with its attendant advantages, obviously, and disadvantages. So here's my take from a political perspective. The only way to get political traction and the action that John's just laid out and this summit should want to see, the only route I can see to put in place the measures of pandemic preparedness, which we would all agree we require, is to prove to the political class, first, that there is an immediate case for action and not just a contingent one. Second, that this action will be politically popular and beneficial. And third, that it will yield a health and therefore an economic gain, which if not immediate, will not seem impossibly distant either. 
This is what I would call the here and now argument for political leaders to act. And it has credibility because COVID had one other unlooked for positive along with all the obvious negatives. It heralded significant, possibly game-changing advances in medical science. Some of these were happening anyway, but have been accelerated. Some were invented as a byproduct of the intensified medical research as a result of COVID. And some completely new ones are at least now within sight, whereas a few years ago, they weren't. These treatments, vaccines, injectables, drugs, are either available now, will shortly become available, and for example, mRNA technology alone has stimulated a plethora of new possibilities. And we can identify them. I mean, John's just been doing this for you. New drugs on the way for TB, malaria, dengue, HIV, all highly applicable to the developing world, but also for influenza, high cholesterol, non-communicable diseases such as cancer, heart attacks and strokes, applicable everywhere. Existing vaccines for HPV have been shown to reduce the risk of cervical cancer in the UK and USA by around 90%. But this disease is just as prevalent in the developing world. Estimates are that just by expanding the age groups of girls receiving these vaccines could save up to 1.7 million lives in 73 lower and middle income countries alone. All in all, we estimate roughly 10 million deaths per year could be saved, probably many more, because they're all attributable to diseases with existing or forthcoming adult vaccines and preventative injectable therapies. So the point I make to political leaders today is that we're standing at the frontier of a new, rich and diverse field of medical science, which potentially revolutionizes global healthcare saving lives, trillions of dollars in lost output, quite apart from a positive impact on stretched government budgets. Now, to access this potential needs a concerted international effort. To switch our healthcare systems from preparing simply for the next crisis, whose advent is uncertain and whose effects are presently unknown, to this always on network of enhanced capability globally, which can both spring into action immediately, should we be gripped by a fresh pandemic, but which in any event can mobilize these changes in medical science to treat and prevent disease here and now. To achieve this requires at least the following elements to be in place. Obviously the investment in new treatments, vaccines and research from the public sector, private, and philanthropic sectors. As John's just been outlining, a much better and faster system of clinical research. Genomic surveillance capacity spread evenly around the world. The infrastructure nationally and globally to capture the data and to register vaccination and treatment. Harmonization of standards and regulation to quicken the approval process the establishment of manufacturing distribution capability in the developing world, as for example, Africa is seeking to do with its partnership for African vaccine manufacturing. And the reform of government systems in individual countries to permit the effective implementation of this always on network. The good news is that all of these elements can be accelerated significantly today through technology. Many of the present instruments of international action are either focused on specific diseases or on children. And this then is mirrored in the modus operandi of many individual healthcare systems. So we need to think through what change these systems need to accommodate adult vaccination at scale, sometimes with multiple doses, and where several conditions can be treated at the same time. My institute works in almost 40 countries now worldwide, but with a special emphasis on Africa and the Far East. Again, there's some good news. There is enormous appetite amongst the governments with whom we work 
for embracing these changes as part of a radical reorganization of their healthcare system. And in, ev in respect of every one of these elements I've just listed, the things that we need to do, there are individual examples of countries successfully implementing one or other or more of those elements. And we know there are large funds from the donor community directed towards healthcare. So the challenge from a political perspective is how to organize the development of the necessary changes so that we create this always on system. My institute, which together with scientists from Oxford University under Sir John and the Ellison Institute for Transformative Medicine under Dr. David Agus, we formed this Global Health Security Consortium and launched what we call the One Shot Campaign, setting out the steps that are vital for always on. Now, I think that the political will can fructify if political leaders see a viable plan. So my suggestion is this, there exists in this room and in the organizations represented by all of you, the expertise to create such a plan. We each have different roles to play, but in combination, nothing that we need to implement this is beyond the knowledge of those present. From this summit, we should work out a process for pulling the plan together. We can then individually and collectively, and of course through the WHO, touch the various points of power within the global political system to show today's leaders that there is both the opportunity for a whole new era of disease treatment and prevention and on a time scale which should be visible and practically achievable even with a short-term political horizon. In a world marked at present by deep geopolitical division, it would show that global action remains open to us in healthcare as in climate change if we have the way and the will. At this moment, it would bring a welcome light of hope at the end of an otherwise pretty gloomy global tunnel. And the great thing, frankly, about this audience is that by and large, your people, we're people who like to do rather than debate. And we're not cynical because we all have experience of how problems can sometimes be solved. But we are frustrated because we know there is so much more that needs to be done and which can be done. And this caused the creation of an always-on global infrastructure for fighting preventable disease and death is one that should motivate us because we know that although it is in the realm of the ambitious, it's not in the realm of the impossible. So that's really uh, my suggestion. In the end, I think there is, a, there is a political appetite amongst political leaders for this if they can see a way of doing it that is practical and achievable. And, you know, all the time I've spent in politics, not just as prime minister of the country here, but afterwards, you know, the thing that is most difficult for political leaders is when they've got a whole series of problems pressing in upon them, and they've got a limited bandwidth to deal with solving those problems. And the best way to enlarge that bandwidth and get that focus is to give them the answer. Because what you find in politics is that people are brilliant at telling you what the problem is. And then when it comes to the answer, they kind of go, well, it's up to you guys. <laughs> so as I say, in this room, actually, I mean, there's a distinguished audience. You've got the people who know what needs to be done. And I think it would be great if from the summit and afterwards, people work together and put together a viable, sensible, serious plan for why this infrastructure could be created, the transformative impact it would have. And then frankly, I think it is for people like me to go out and say to today's generation of leaders, here it is, it's doable, it's gonna bring you political benefit. And most important of all, you'll do something which for humanity will be extraordinary, revolutionary, and game-changing. Thank you very much.